Hello, my name is Egon Chowakian. The impetus for my address today is the release of the highly impactful documentary film, The Impact. My keen interest in this film is well-founded as it turns out to be based on materials from our 10-year investigation, some of the results of which I publicly disclosed in April of this year. This film reveals the detailed plans of the force I have mentioned in my previous speeches, known by various monikers such as the Architects of Consciousness, the secret KGB department that has maintained its activity and influence to this very day, and the Hydra, which seeks to destroy the United States and establish a totalitarian regime of its power worldwide. The impact sheds light on how this destructive shadow force operates today, shaping international geopolitical trends, orchestrating global conflicts and terrorist attacks, manipulating entire peoples and nations, and sowing hatred and division among them. The documentary's creators have named this hidden force Global Anti-Cultism. This investigative film has already sparked serious discussions in high political circles, the diplomatic corps, and government structures, which is not surprising. It should be noted that for many influential figures who consider themselves architects of global politics and international relations, such a turn of events was unexpected. Currently, all the facts and data presented in this investigation are undergoing meticulous analysis and verification by competent authorities. It is important to emphasize that a significant portion of the information has already been corroborated by an extensive evidentiary base. This means that from this moment onward, the discourse surrounding this film will inexorably escalate and inevitably translate into actions. Actions that this film has prematurely instigated. Allow me to clarify my stance. Yes, freedom of speech and independent journalism are foundational values of our democracy. And the emergence of such fundamental journalistic endeavors represents the exercise of the right to free speech and opinion. At first glance, the release of the impact appears to be good news as the truth has come to light. However, I must express my primary concern. Humanity is simply not yet ready for this truth. We, particularly my colleagues and I, are well aware of who stands behind the creation of this documentary, who its authors are, and how they acquired the materials from our investigation, some of which they recklessly and prematurely disclosed in the film. I wish to address these evidently courageous but exceedingly impatient individuals who brought this film to fruition. Esteemed creators of the film, The Impact, do you realize what you have done? We understand that you were driven by noble motives, love of humanity, altruism, and patriotism. And this is undoubtedly commendable. However, Allow me to confront you with the reality that you have outpaced the times. You have publicly disclosed data and materials that were not yet ready to be revealed to the world at large. Yes, I do agree that people have the right to know the truth. Yes, you have accomplished an impressive feat, but you cannot fathom the additional complexities you have introduced to our work through these actions. Understand, that when dealing with global matters, patience is paramount. Your impatience in this instance has complicated the investigative process. Had this information been made public, say, a year or so from now, the outcomes would have been far less dramatic. However, you have prematurely triggered certain consequences. You have, in turn, publicly disclosed specific methods employed by both anti-cult organizations and the force you termed as the global anti-cult. You excessively detailed their schemes and overly elaborated on their plans. You have revealed what should have remained concealed for at least one other year. 
Now, authorities in any country where anti-cult organizations operate have no legal right to ignore and must hold accountable to the fullest extent of the law all individuals mentioned in the film, especially considering the existence of an extensive base of incontrovertible facts and evidence of their criminal terrorist activities. Thus, not only from a moral standpoint, but also in accordance with current legislation, the lack of an appropriate response from the authorities to the disclosed facts could be construed as complacency in terrorist activities. This applies to top-tier politicians and intelligence agencies. Should they fail to respond and hold the guilty accountable, if they do not oppose them, then according to the law, they become not just accomplices in criminal activities, but also enablers of the resurgence of Nazism and the establishment of a Fourth Reich. Authors of the impact, do you actually comprehend what you have done? You have provoked actions prematurely. This now provides the deep-seated ideologues of the world disorder, the representatives of the global anti-cult with an opportunity to further conceal themselves. Yes, you have widely exposed the criminal actions of their pawns, anti-cult organizations, media representatives, and their network of accomplices. All of them will unequivocally be held accountable for their monstrous deeds, for terrorism, Nazism, and genocide. Their involvement in crimes against humanity has already been substantiated by an extensive body of evidence, which continues to grow daily. However, you must be aware that all the figures, individuals, and names you have highlighted in the film, The Impact, are merely executors. Just like the sprawling network of anti-cult organizations, they are nothing more than the lizard's tail which it can easily shed when needed. These are pawns, sacrificed without hesitation in the grand scheme. By following their trail and apprehending them, the enforcement agencies will be left literally holding only the lizard's tail. While the lizard itself, that is to say the principal ideologues of the global anti-cult, those who actually truly pull the strings will vanish from sight and, like the dung beetle, will now attempt to burrow even deeper. We will undoubtedly continue our investigation and ultimately unearth these global manipulators, no matter how deeply they burrow. But your actions have significantly complicated this task for us. Now a vast number of people will have to undertake an immense amount of additional work to achieve the desired outcome. The primary objective of the investigation is to identify and hold accountable the key ideologues of the global destructive process. Only such an approach will effectively curtail their activities. It is crucial to ensure the collection of comprehensive evidence, preventing any involved individuals from evading responsibility. However, the premature disclosure of information risks shifting public scrutiny to mere executors, the front-facing individuals and organizations, while actually allowing the true orchestrators to cover their tracks and conceal their involvement. Please understand, I am not attempting to diminish the significance of your work. Instead, I recognize your noble intentions and greatly appreciate your pursuit of the truth. Yet, I must express my concern. Such serious actions as you have undertaken require coordination and alignment. You could have at very least sought my counsel. History has repeatedly shown us that being ahead of one's time can often have unpredictable consequences. Since the authors of the documentary touched upon Russia, let us recall, for instance, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, a politician whose forecasts often preceded their time and whose truthful statements about the climate boldly resonated in the public domain. 
or consider the recent example of the Alatra organization, which also was ahead of its time, daring to speak the truth about catastrophic climate changes in Russia that threatened the entire world. What became of its story? In Russia and in Ukraine, under orders from Russia, Alatra was silenced and brutally persecuted, thus disgracefully trampling on freedom of speech and human rights in these countries. By order of certain representatives of Russian authorities, a repressive apparatus was unleashed upon Alatra. This is a flagrant act of suppressing truth and persecuting those who dare to challenge falsehoods. Both Mr. Zhirinovsky and the participants of Alatra sounded the alarm about a massive climate catastrophe in Russia and the world. They were ignored. They were silenced. They were misunderstood. Why? Because society was not ready for the bitter truth. So journalists who created the film, The Impact, remember this. Truths are only accepted by society when the appropriate time comes. Yes, the release of your documentary, The Impact, has become a catalyst for serious public debate. It exposed the root causes of certain tragic events taking place in the United States and the world. Specifically, I refer to the acute topic you addressed, puzzle coding. Puzzle coding is a sophisticated method of covert psychological manipulation that underlies many of the tragedies of our time, including the epidemic of school shootings, mass shootings, and political violence. Two recent assassination attempts on Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico and on former, possibly future U.S. President Donald Trump are striking examples of this threat. The shooters in both cases fell victim to preliminary puzzle coding, a method employed by the ideologues of the global anti-cult. These same ideologues are behind anti-cult organizations such as Rossiers in Russia. The puzzle coding method is so sophisticated that individuals cannot perceive its influence on themselves. After several waves of subliminal implants coordinated through the media, the targeted person becomes a controllable puppet directed by global players against their desired target. Both the attackers and their victims are mere pawns in this grand game. However, behind the scenes of these horrifying events lurk the true architects of global manipulation. It is they who select the political targets for elimination and the educational institutions where puzzle coding of students is conducted, provoking school shootings. It is they who develop manipulative strategies and coordinate the actions of their agents worldwide. The danger posed by the puzzle coding method to society and every individual is truly immense. You or any of your loved ones could become the next shooter or the victim of a shooter until the activities of the global anti-cult are halted. During our investigation, we encountered difficulties disseminating data about this method through official channels. However, Public disclosure of this information has proven effective in reaching a broad audience. Today, the issue of puzzle coding must become a topic of active discussion, not only among the civilian population, but also in research circles and national security agencies. It is also essential to emphasize that the public revelation of this information imposes significant responsibility on state authorities. Now that threats like puzzle coding are known, governments are expected to take active measures to prevent them. If after these revelations, egregious cases of mass shootings or assassination attempts on politicians continue to occur in any country, it will be a clear indication that the authorities of that state have failed or have chosen not to effectively utilize the information to protect their citizens. Thus, 
government inaction in light of these disclosures can be construed as an ability to ensure national security and the well-being of the population. Moreover, let me highlight another highly positive effect of bringing the problem of puzzle coding into the public eye. A potential shooter may halt their course of action by learning the truth about the real causes of their destructive intentions. Knowing the signs of the influence of the puzzle coding method, a person upon recognizing bipolar disorder and other symptoms within themselves can critically reassess their mental framework and motivations. This can lead to restoring critical perception of their thoughts and actions. In such cases, there is a high likelihood that a future shooter, having watched the film The Impact and learned the truth about the origins of their destructive thoughts, will actually abandon their criminal intentions. Thus, the threat of mass shootings worldwide could actually be minimized by 80%, provided that the information about the puzzle coding method gains widespread dissemination. I want to also thank the creators of the film, The Impact, for at least not revealing all the cards regarding the working of the puzzle coding method. You provided just enough information to understand its danger and its mechanism. Additionally, I would like to note another inevitable consequence of the release of the film, The Impact. Specifically, now that the masks have been removed from the pawns of the global anti-cult, its visible executors, anti-cult organizations, and their media accomplices, it is only natural that they react aggressively in the informational space. They will undoubtedly strive to defend their positions vigorously, using their agents of influence. This includes attempting to recruit new journalists to spread disinformation and slander against me. Indeed, the recruitment of new journalists is one of their defense strategies in case of failure to create the appearance of mass support for their innocence and rightness and discredit those who uncovered the truth. Remember, they wage their war against democracy exclusively in the informational field, manipulating authorities, law enforcement, and public opinion. However, such actions are nothing more than a desperate attempt on their part to defend themselves, realizing the inevitability of their defeat. Everyone who still supports them and is involved in their dehumanizing rhetoric must understand the futility of this path. The film, The Impact, can help them grasp the consequences and the seriousness of the laws under which such criminal activities are now judged. I would like to specifically address journalists approached by anti-cult agents with such defamatory assignments. Money is of course tempting, but before accepting it, consider whether you might be repeating the fate of Judas. And now, let me transition to the main point of my address. Today we must acknowledge the current state of affairs the film, The Impact, which poses upon certain challenges to our activities, is already available to the general public. In light of the intense public discussion surrounding it, allow me to share my perspective on a number of issues it raises. In this film, the authors focus on the tip of the iceberg, the activities of the anti-cult movement. However, anti-cult organizations are merely one of the Hydra's tentacles of the global anti-cult phenomena, just one of its tools. The real danger lies in the expansive network of influence that has permeated all sections of society. The methods of discreditation and dehumanization initially developed by anti-cult organizations to counter religious groups are now widely employed by the global anti-cult against political figures, social groups, and entire nations. These techniques are used on a much larger scale, affecting various spheres and leading to colossal destructive consequences. By employing their covert manipulation tactics, the forces of the global anti-cult are currently inciting civil war in America. 
As accurately noted in the film, The Impact, the initiation of a brutal civil war in America is the first step in the final phase of the global anti cultist plan to seize total power worldwide. Their primary objective is to destabilize the fundamental force that safeguards human rights and freedoms, that is to say, the United States of America. Today, all Americans observe and feel the monstrous level of divisiveness within American society. Political rhetoric is becoming increasingly aggressive. What was once deemed unacceptable is now seen as the norm. For example, calls for violence or the eradication of political opponents have become part of public discourse. All of this points to the significant influence of the global anti-cult representatives on social and political processes in the USA. It is no coincidence that the accomplices of the global anti-cult movement have recently been especially active in introducing terms like cult, destructive cult, and cultist, along with other derogatory epithets, into the public narrative to describe various groups political forces, or individuals. This manipulative technique is aimed at dehumanizing opponents. This very technique can turn people who were initially neutral toward each other into enemies ready to tear each other apart. Observe for yourself what associations the terms destructive cult and totalitarian sect evoke in you. Whom do you picture when you hear these words? You most likely envision not people, but comatose beings, almost animals. Those labeled with the term cult are viewed in the same way the Nazis viewed Jews during the Holocaust. They too saw them not as humans, but as subhumans that could be exterminated. Doesn't it seem to you that something similar is happening in America today? One part of society perceives the other with the same hostility with both sides using various derogatory and dehumanizing labels, which paves the way for violence. This is precisely how Americans are being prepared for conflict today. More accurately, for a full-scale civil war. A striking example of how such persecution leads to horrific consequences is the tragedy of the Waco siege in Texas in 1993. This event was extensively covered in the film, The Impact. Do you remember that terrible siege of the Branch Davidian complex? The documentary film, The Impact, unveiled the long awaited and I'm sure for many shocking truth about this tragedy. Think about it. How could it happen that unverified accusations and biases led to the death of 86 American citizens? including 25 innocent children at the hands of other American citizens. Those who took on the responsibility to protect American citizens ended up willfully and intentionally killing them. American citizens killed American citizens. Finally, the true orchestrators of this well-planned massacre have been identified and the methods of their influence on both sides both the besiegers and the besieged have been exposed. The film, The Impact, illustrated how the anti-cult propaganda machine operates using the events in Waco, Texas as an example. Did you notice how the media shaped the negative image of the group? How easily did the term cult turn people into something non-human in the eyes of society? Think about it. Isn't the same thing happening today with Americans demonizing each other? I want to draw your attention to the fact that the anti-cultists altogether avoid interacting and negotiating with those they dehumanize, and they forbid their accomplices in the media from doing so. This is done to ensure that the perpetrators of the information terror attacks cannot see the eyes of their victims and realize that they are dealing with fellow human beings. This tactic has deep psychological roots. The lack of personal contact allows for maintaining distance and avoiding emotional involvement. 
Even on the battlefield, not every soldier can shoot at the enemy while seeing their eyes. However, artillerymen firing from a great distance do not experience such moral pressure. A soldier fighting in the trenches and seeing the eyes of his opponents will remember those faces for a long time. On the other hand, an artilleryman will not be haunted by such visions, as he does not see those he targets. The same behavioral tactic was applied during the Siege of Waco. Throughout the entire subsequent disinformation campaign, other members of the organization were deliberately ignored, and almost all of them remained nameless, devoid of individuality. The people who lived at Mount Carmel, including children, were never presented to the public as personalities. The Federal Bureau of Investigation didn't share with the media the videos of the Davidians recorded during the siege, so that Americans wouldn't regard them as human beings, feel sympathy for them, and stand up for them. Waco is not just a tragedy of the past, it is a warning for the future. And today, Texas remains a sort of testing ground for anti-cult strategies. The provocative actions in Texas last year involving succession attempts in opposition to the federal government can be seen as a kind of rehearsal for the internal civil conflict. It was, so to speak, a preliminary test to see if the launch button works. Having observed the readiness for radical actions, the situation in Texas was temporarily settled in a planned manner. However, it demonstrated the critical point, the potential for serious confrontation. This incident revealed that all the necessary ingredients for civil conflict are in place for global players. The Texas secession movement is gaining unprecedented strength, with over 30% of the state's residents ready to support independence and Texas proponents have been elected to leadership positions. I am certain you understand well that the signs of readiness for civil conflict are not limited to the events in Texas. The fact that Americans today are led by anti-cult rhetoric is in itself an alarming sign. And while we will undoubtedly put an end to this disgraceful phenomenon of anti-cultism, each American will have to deal with their own mind. And this needs to be done now. It is essential to urgently restore critical thinking, learn to recognize manipulative techniques in the media and politics, and overcome imposed stereotypes and enemy images. I believe Americans can achieve this and become an example for others. After all, the same divisive processes that anti-cultism catalyzes in America are now also being initiated in Europe. While a civil war in America is the first step in the final part of the enemy strategy for victory, the second step is provoking the collapse of the European Union. I want to draw your attention to the alarming signs indicating a growing trend towards disintegration within the EU. Firstly, political fragmentation within individual European countries is worsening. For nearly a decade now, the EU has been trying to curb anti-democratic developments within some of its member states, but unfortunately, with little success. There is a widespread decline in the rule of law across Europe. Secondly, in the context of increased competition between geopolitical blocs, the number of disagreements between EU member states on a wide range of issues, including economic and geopolitical matters, is growing. This creates a favorable breeding ground for political polarization and radicalization of society. Thirdly, the migration crisis is intensifying and disagreements on this issue among EU countries are already increasing. They will continue to gain momentum in the near future. I would add, French President Emmanuel Macron's recent statement about Europe's mortality vividly illustrates the level of concern among European leaders. Moreover, the deep-seated disagreements between France and Germany, which previously stood together, 
on key strategic planning issues seriously aggravate the situation. All these factors point to a well-organized force working behind the scenes, deliberately provoking European disintegration processes. Thus, global anti-cultism, a force aiming for the redistribution and usurpation of geopolitical power in the world, poses a colossal danger to both the USA and Europe today. However, it is crucial to emphasize the existence of another side suffering maximum damage and hardship from the influence of this hidden shadow force. I assert with full authority that the greatest danger global anti-cultism presents today is to Islam. Right now we are on the brink of a large-scale civilizational war. This is not an abstract conflict between the West and the East. It is a concrete confrontation between the Islamic world and the rest of the world, which today by all indications is being artificially inflamed by a hidden destructive force, global anti-cultism. Allow me to provide some context on global events. Pay attention to the trends of recent decades. We observe systematic violations of the rights of Muslims worldwide in Europe, America, and Russia. In the United States, according to data from the Council on American-Islamic Relations, there has been a sharp increase in the hate crimes against Muslims and growing activity from anti-Muslim hate groups in recent years. In October 2023, a prominent American figure speaking out against Islam published an article in which he made the following statement about Muslims. We're in a war between savages and civilization. I think that makes it eminently clear to you just what meaning the accomplices of the anti-cultism attribute to the expression civilizational war, a war of civilization against savages who, in their view, must be eradicated. Why? Because Muslims are representatives of a religion of peace and moral purity, and Islam itself, with its strong and unwavering traditions, is seen as highly inconvenient to those who seek global control. It is no coincidence that there was a significant surge in anti-Islamic sentiment in October 2023, coinciding with a new escalation in the Israeli-Palestine conflict. It is crucial to understand that this long-standing conflict between Israel and Palestine, which could have been resolved long ago, is deliberately sustained and inflamed by representatives of global anti-cultism. Significant funds are poured into one side, strengthening it ideologically and materially. Why? The answer is clear. To create the conditions for a global civilizational war, which would be practically inevitable today if the plans of its ideologues were not exposed. Through this conflict in various countries, hatred towards Muslims is being incited on one side, while the other side, the Muslim community, is provoked into retaliatory actions. In Germany and Austria, for instance, there has been a record increase in anti-Islamic sentiments. In Britain, the number of crimes against Muslims has risen by 140%. European law enforcement agencies receive numerous reports of regular insults and attacks on Muslims, which in recent years have been fueled by inhumane public rhetoric. At the same time, human rights advocates Note that European authorities are slow to respond to these blatant manifestations of hatred towards Muslims. It is reported that in Germany, where the number of anti-Muslim incidents has at least doubled in a year, the authorities pay little attention to this. At the same time, mainstream political parties adopt the policies of the far right, some of whose members are often inclined towards anti-Muslim sentiments. Adding to this horrifying picture are provocative actions such as the public burning of the Muslim holy book, the Quran, in Sweden and in Denmark in 2023. In Sweden, this occurred 
on June 8th during Islam's major holiday, Eid al-Adha. Subsequent Quran burnings in Denmark took place publicly near the embassies of the Muslim countries. These actions triggered a wave of anger in the Islamic world, exacerbating an already tense situation. Threats from Iranian militias followed and Iran severed diplomatic and business relations with Sweden. Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson described the situation as we are currently in the most serious security situation since the Second World War. The supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, stated that Sweden has entered a state of readiness for war with the Muslim world. In response, the head of the Chechen Republic in Russia, Ramzan Kadyrov, called on the entire Muslim world to take action. He is quoted as saying, I urge the leaders of Islamic states to wake up and do everything possible to protect our religion from crime. Otherwise, it will be too late. He also questioned what Muslim leaders are doing to prevent the situation and why they allow our holy scriptures to be openly desecrated. A troubling trend of growing anti-Islamic sentiments is also being observed in Russia, where this process is likewise catalyzed by the forces of global anti-cultism. The horrific terrorist attack in Crocus City Hall on March 22nd, carried out by individuals from Tajikistan, a Muslim-majority country, served as a catalyst for the tightening of immigration policies in Russia and a surge of xenophobic sentiments within Russian society. This event sparked a wave of negative attitudes towards Muslims and persecution by law enforcement agencies. Particular attention should be paid to the incident in Dagestan, which occurred three months after the Crocus tragedy. On June 23rd, an important holy day for Orthodox Christians, that is to say Trinity Day or Pentecost, Militants quite literally carried out attacks in the cities of Mahachkala and Derbent. They set fire to churches and a synagogue, killing 22 people, including an Orthodox priest. The timing of the attack on a significant Christian holiday and the presence of deliberately left inscriptions pointing to ayat from the Quran at the crime scenes all point to a targeted intentional provocation to incite interreligious strife and fuel hatred towards Islam. This provocation led to even harsher treatment of Muslims and migrants by Russian law enforcement and the introduction of stricter legislative measures. Consequently, security forces began conducting raids in mosques, including during Friday prayers, deeply offending Russian Muslims. The provided examples of events, statements, and anti-Islamic provocations in Russia, Europe, and the USA are just part of the troubling trends observed worldwide. All these events should be seen as links in a chain aimed at creating the conditions for a more significant conflict, a civilizational war between Islam and the rest of the world. Another clear fact further indicates this. Amid the escalation of interfaith tensions globally and the rise of anti-Islamic sentiments, we have observed in recent years the deliberate stimulation of migration flows from Muslim countries to Europe. At first glance, this may seem counterintuitive to the national security logic of the receiving countries. However, a deeper analysis of the geopolitical situation reveals that this is part of a larger plan. It is no coincidence that among the migrants from Muslim countries, there is a disproportionately high percentage of strong young men of working age, many of whom have military training. It is no coincidence that there is a deliberate lack of effective integration of these groups into European society. And it is no coincidence that there is a parallel rise in the anti-Islamic sentiments in the host countries. These factors collectively create the prerequisites for a large-scale civilizational conflict 
between the Islamic and non-Islamic worlds. In this conflict, Muslim migrants within the host countries will play a pivotal role. It is important to note that the migrants themselves may not currently be aware of their role in the potential conflict. Still, they will be mobilized under certain conditions. Currently, they represent what we would call a sleeper force that will be activated at a critical moment by those who originally conceived and planned this migration strategy, the very scriptwriters of this migration being global anti-cultism. According to the multi-stage strategy of global anti-cultism, the uprising of the Muslim world is the third step in their final strategy to achieve global chaos. As I mentioned earlier, the first step is a civil war in America. The second step is the disintegration of the European Union, accompanied by the escalation of anti-Muslim sentiments and critical violations of Muslims' rights. The third step is large-scale Muslim uprisings in Europe, followed by the involvement of major Islamic states under the pretext of protecting their fellow believers. The culmination of this scenario is as follows. Major Islamic geopolitical players, taking advantage of the weakened and torn apart America and Europe, will decide on a global retaliatory step, a full-scale military intervention using nuclear weapons in revenge for years of oppression, hatred, and humiliation. This scenario includes the mandatory use of nuclear weapons by Islamic countries, which will undoubtedly trigger retaliatory nuclear strikes. Given the significant imbalance of nuclear arsenals between Islamic and non-Islamic countries, such a confrontation will inevitably result in catastrophic consequences for the Islamic world. It will be a terrible tragedy for all humanity. According to the plans of global anti-cultism, this war will lead to unprecedented human losses. They cynically calculate that the number of casualties will reach at least 3 billion people. This horrifying number includes almost the entire Muslim world. Thus, the rise of narratives about nuclear war, which you increasingly hear from politicians, journalists, and public figures, is not accidental. This is all part of a plan to prepare society for the impending, unimaginable sacrifices, the idea of the inevitable use of nuclear weapons in a very near future is being actively implanted into public consciousness. Typically, these calls are made in the context of Russian-American relations. In reality, the use of nuclear weapons is planned in the brewing civilizational war between Islam and the rest of the world. Ask yourself, what is the true goal of this scenario devised by global anti-cultism? One of the goals is quite apparent, control over resources. The territories of the Middle East, home to Islamic states, will, after being devastated by nuclear strikes, become a kind of conserved reserves for the future. As the experience of Ukraine's Chernobyl shows, these lands can be redeveloped in 20 to 30 years, and gas and oil can be safely extracted from them. And the ultimate and key goal of the shadow global manipulators, as banal as it may sound, is one, world domination. The plan of global anti-cultism is simple and cynical. Provoke the Islamic world into aggression against a weakened Europe and America, by exploiting accumulated grievances and the substantial army of Muslims within these countries. Then, under the pretext of assistance, intervene in the conflict from the side of non-Islamic countries of the Eastern world, where their power is already established. This will further destabilize the situation and allow them to take totalitarian control of a world shattered by wars and conflicts. It is important to note that as a result of this civilizational war, not only will representatives of Islam be wiped off the face of the earth, but the countries that are today considered the bastions of Western civilization 
will also suffer enormous losses. The populations of these countries will make up a significant portion of the billions sacrificed in these monstrous plans. Their victims will be us. For these cruel shadow players, the true civilization is only themselves. To date, when considering issues related to Islam and the potential threat of a civilizational conflict, even a mid-level analyst, after watching the film The Impact and studying and comparing the publicity available facts and data, would come to the same conclusion I have arrived at. A civilizational war is practically inevitable. Only a few steps remain before its onset. The forces of global anti-cultism are so focused on honing their dark plans for world domination and conserving fossil resources for themselves that they either do not see or prefer to ignore the elephant in the room, the primary threat that can put a definitive end to any of their meticulously crafted strategies. This threat is the rapid and catastrophic climate change. What kind of conservation of natural resources can we talk about if, in two or three decades, our planet will only be habitable for extremophiles and tardigrades, capable of surviving even in Martian conditions? Indeed, we risk repeating the fate of Mars within the next 10 years. I have mentioned this before, and I will say it again. The current dangerous state of Earth's climate is not only due to anthropogenic impacts, but also cyclical geodynamic processes that provoke an increase in cataclysms and extreme heating of the ocean and atmosphere. Without timely measures, this cyclical phase could be humanity's last. The situation has dramatically worsened in Russia with an alarming increase in natural disasters since the second half of 2023. What is the cause of the surge? As I have already explained in detail, the reason lies in the shutdown of specialized experimental equipment that operated in Russia from 2013 to August of 2023. This equipment was developed with the participation of scientists associated with the international movement ALATRA. This equipment allowed the minimization of extreme climate phenomena. After the Alatra movement was declared undesirable in Russia, the operation of the experimental equipment was duly halted. The consequences were not long in coming. Destructive storms, abnormal snowfalls and hurricanes and increased intensity began to attack Russian territories. You can clearly see on a graph how effectively these phenomena were contained and how sharply the situation deteriorated after the equipment was turned off. This immediately reflected a rapid increase in the number of severity and extreme climate events. Note that the graph shows a stable plateau from 2013 to 2022, indicating the absence of an increase in meteorological hazards. However, since August 2023, when the experimental equipment was shut down, the number of catastrophes in Russia has begun to rise rapidly, leading to an increase in the intensity and destructiveness of extreme climate events. It is expected that starting in 2025, the growth in the number of catastrophes in Russia will take on an exponential nature, following the trend observed worldwide. I warned about these dangerous consequences in advance. And on September 3rd, 2023, a representative of Alatra, the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov, publicly voiced these forecasts and concerns. But we were not heard. The result is evident. In 2024, Russia was overwhelmed by unprecedented floods, squalls and tornadoes. Neighboring countries, China, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Eastern Europe also felt the negative consequences of the equipment shutdown. This year, they are especially suffering from relentless natural disasters. The equipment was installed in Russia because Siberia is a crucial hotspot for the planet's abnormal heating. Now that the equipment is deactivated, Nothing is mitigating the situation and it will only worsen in Russia and globally. Moreover, 
Note how rapidly seismic activity is increasing on the planet. Look at the dynamics of the growth of earthquakes with magnitudes of 5, 6, and 7. According to dry mathematical calculations, without considering aggravating factors, by 2029, the frequency of magnitude 7 earthquakes will increase tenfold, marking the beginning of an era of global destruction and chaos. Cities will be destroyed, infrastructure will be annihilated, and billions of people will become refugees. The economic and social consequences will be so vast that they could lead to the complete collapse of modern civilization. And this is not a hypothetical scenario of a distant future. This is instead our reality in a few short years, if we do not take radical measures immediately. The most lamentable fact is that while exacerbating the climate situation demands immediate consolidation of the international community and close cooperation among all countries, the world remains instead focused on resolving geopolitical interest, struggles for dominance, and the redivision of spheres of influence. Let me assure you, it will not be long before no one will be able to ignore the planetary danger currently looming over all humanity. Now I would like to focus on the main aspect of my address. Given that the film, The Impact, is already publicly available and there is no turning back, it is time for an honest conversation. This conversation will only partially address the topics raised in the film. The primary goal of my address today is an attempt to save the world from the inevitable destruction it is heading toward. The cause of this destruction today can be traced to one specific individual who has the power to resolve a global problem or merely consciously allow it to reach its logical, tragic end. I am speaking now about Mr. Vladimir Putin. I sincerely hope that the information I will present in this video does not escape his attention, that he is able to draw conclusions from it, and that he takes actions that could influence the fate of the world. But let's take things one step at a time. In light of the information presented in the film, The Impact, I find it necessary to highlight a critical factor that undermines the foundations of democracy and diplomatic interaction, threatening the very existence of our civilization. At this crucial moment in our shared history, with the looming climate threat, eliminating all obstacles to peaceful cooperation between countries is of paramount importance. However, we are confronted with a profoundly troubling reality. The resurgence of Nazi ideology, its methods and practices in the modern world. The application of advanced mind manipulation technologies, which were used during the Nazi era, has created the geopolitical chessboard we all observe today. As accurately analyzed by the creators of the film, The Impact, the current pace of events suggests that soon we could witness the rapid and irreversible collapse of freedom and democracy. Today we have direct evidence that Nazism unfortunately did not vanish with the fall of the Third Reich. We won the battle back then, but the war is still to be won. It is with deep concern that I must state that the fact that the methodology and practices of Nazism have persisted to this day, transmitted directly through the activities of specific individuals and organizations. The results of thorough research conducted by the analysts and creators of the film The Impact convincingly demonstrate that identifying these historical connections is entirely feasible. Moreover, the ongoing large-scale international investigation is already yielding concrete results. It enables the identification of those responsible for introducing Nazi practices and ideology into the modern world even if in veiled or modified forms. This process is of utmost importance because the threat of Nazism not only undermines the foundations of international cooperation and peace, but also endangers the very principles of humanity, 
equality, and justice for which our predecessors paid an exorbitant price. It is absolutely unacceptable that during this unprecedentedly challenging period for all humanity, certain forces continue their inhumane activities. While the entire world teeters on the brink of an abyss, these hostile forces are deliberately undermining our collective efforts to save the planet. Therefore, we face an urgent and crucial task. Since representatives of the so-called global anti-cultism occupying key positions in various structures continue to exert covert yet significant influence on decision-making processes and the shaping of public opinion, measures must be taken to limit their ability to influence global politics and society as a whole. Only by eliminating this hidden influence can we move forward in addressing the more pressing issue of the climate collapse threat and the potential extinction of all humanity. In the current situation, as I am directly involved in investigating the activities of the Global Anti-Cultism Network and simultaneously deeply knowledgeable about the rapidly escalating climate threat and its true causes, I consider it my duty and an honor to explain and convey some of my thoughts to the public, specific influential figures, and representatives of global anti-cultism, who, as I know, would certainly are closely monitoring my public addresses. Today's speech will be significantly different from previous ones. In light of the disclosed information, I now have the opportunity to speak openly and directly calling things by their names. This new level of transparency will allow for clearer communication about the challenges facing the global community. I sincerely hope that the message I am delivering today will be a message of peace, a catalyst for significant changes, and a step towards establishing a constructive intergovernmental dialogue to address the looming climate threat. As detailed in the film, The Impact, today the bearers of Nazi ideology and methods have made their haven in Russia, gradually transforming this country into a semblance of Nazi Germany. These processes occur covertly, but we have all observed their consequences over the past three decades. First and foremost, they manifest as transformations in various spheres of society within Russia itself. Starting from 1993, we observed trends indicating the formation of nascent totalitarianism and nationalism within Russia. These trends intensified from the mid-1990s and continued to grow. Today, we have factual evidence and substantial grounds to assert that all the signs of fascism and its extremely radical form, Nazism, are already being implemented in practice in Russia. Now I would like to elaborate on some of these signs. The first is anti-democratism and systematic human rights violations, such as the right of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of assembly. The film Impact presented numerous examples of such violations in Russia. Another dangerous sign of fascism, which paves the way for legitimizing state arbitrariness in violating citizens' fundamental rights is the disregard and violation of international law norms and principles. According to the amendments to the Russian Constitution, adopted on March 14, 2020, the supremacy of the Russian Constitution over international law and treaties was established. As a result, Russian citizens have effectively been isolated from the global system of human rights protection and democratic freedoms. It is also worth noting the unprecedented increase in the influence of Russia's coercive apparatus, that is to say the police and security services. Initially intended to protect citizens and maintain public order, these structures have since transformed into instruments of political repression. They conduct searches and detentions without sufficient legal grounds. They violate citizens' rights to privacy, abuse their authority, resort to excessive force, and even engage in torture and the elimination of dissenting individuals. The scale of such repressions have achieved unprecedented levels. 
Citizens are detained not only for participating in peaceful protest, which in itself is a gross violation of basic human rights, but also for activities undertaken on the internet. People are persecuted for subscribing to opposition groups on social media and even for comments on posts critical of the government. These actions by the authorities have an obvious goal, to intimidate the population and suppress any manifestation of dissent or to criticism. Thus, law enforcement agencies in Russia have turned into a monster that devours the freedom and dignity of citizens. They sow terror and contribute to the strengthening of the totalitarian regime. These methods of control and suppression mirror those used by Nazis. During Nazi Germany, the ruling regime exercised comprehensive control over all spheres of societal life through the SS protective squads and the Gestapo, the secret state police subordinate to them. Today we are deeply troubled to observe how the Russian law enforcement agencies and the security services, namely the Ministry of Internal Affairs, MVD, and the Federal Security Service, FSB, are acquiring traits and powers similar to those of the Gestapo and the SS. The scale of control and influence these structures exert over all aspects of citizens' lives has reached colossal proportions. Their functions and methods of operation, such as exercising political control and suppressing opposition, identifying and persecuting so-called enemies of the state, and carrying out extrajudicial repressions and executions increasingly resemble the infamous practices of the SS and Gestapo. In effect, we are witnessing the formation of a modern analog of these repressive bodies in Russia, adopted to the realities of the 21st century. Simultaneously, there is a rapid degradation of the independent judicial system in Russia. More and more frequently, judicial decisions are made not based on facts, evidence, and the letter of the law, but on direct instructions from representatives of the executive branch, the prosecutor general's office, and even the close circle of the head of state. This is a flagrant violation of the principle of separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary. Currently, courts in Russia are used as tools to suppress dissent and even conduct show trials, where under the guise of vague legal formulations, people are declared extremists or accomplices of terrorism without sufficient grounds. This trend is particularly evident in cases related to the deportation of Muslims following the terrorist attack of Crocus City Hall. The courts demonstrate bias and injustice disregarding fundamental human rights and principles of justice. The most illustrative case of such selective justice, where judicial authorities were pressured by the presidential administration, was the trial of the Alatra organization. During the judicial process against Alatra in Russia, we witnessed blatant evidence falsification, obvious manipulation of materials, and unprecedented pressure on judges from certain representatives of the presidential administration. In the complete absence of factual evidence, accusations were literally fabricated out of thin air. Subsequently, the activities of the Alatra organization were unlawfully banned in Russia. Following this, we witnessed illegal detentions, unjustified searches, and invasions into citizens' homes under trumped-up pretenses. It is particularly distressing that the victims of these repressions are law-abiding citizens, true patriots of their country, people who genuinely care about the future of their state and could make invaluable contributions to its development, are literally being persecuted and deprived of their constitutional rights and freedoms. These purges are nothing short of manifestations of modern Nazism. Fascist regimes are also characterized by the absence of pluralism in the media, control over mass media, strict ideological censorship, and powerful state propaganda. What we observe in Russia today goes far beyond ordinary censorship 
and represents an attempt at total control over the country's information field. Independent Russian media are under pressure. They are branded as foreign agents and extremist organizations, which is effectively equivalent to banning their activities. Censorship in social networks is intensifying daily, and platforms that the state cannot fully control are being banned. A particularly illustrative example is Russia's recent ban on the Rumble platform. This decision was made not of national security or public order considerations, but solely because the platform refused to block the channel of the Alatra organization. This organization publishes scientifically based forecasts on climate change, including prognosis about the future worsening of the climate situation in Russia itself. Essentially, we are witnessing an attempt to hide vital information about the future of their own country from the citizens. I want to express my deep, sincere respect for Rumble CEO Chris Pavlovsky, who despite the threat of losing a vast marketplace, remained faithful to the principles of democracy and freedom of information. His refusal to unjustly censor an organization that had violated no laws exemplifies steadfast commitment to fundamental democratic values and uncompromised defense of citizens' inalienable rights and freedoms. What needs to be emphasized in this situation is that a reputable international company was instantly banned in Russia the moment it refused to comply with the authorities' demands and act against the principles of freedom of speech and open information exchange. This incident is not just a wake-up call. It is instead an alarm bell heralding the death of freedom of speech in Russia. We are witnessing the transformation of a once open society into a closed system where the state solely determines what information is accessible to citizens. Increasingly, we see unprecedented state interference in education, culture, science, sports, the economy, historical consciousness, and even in the private lives of citizens in Russia. Under the guise of noble slogans about preserving traditions and family values, everyday life is becoming increasingly regulated. A cult of personality around the state leader is forming, which is a direct sign of fascism. Of course, Putin's cult in Russia is not as strong as Hitler's or Stalin's once was. Still, the image of President Putin is systematically elevated to a national symbol. The public discourse shapes the notion of the leader's involability and fallibility. His words are taken as absolute truth, and his role is presented as indispensable for the state's very existence. The slogan, Russia exists because of Putin, no Putin, no Russia, vividly illustrates this dangerous trend of equating the leader's personality with the fate of the entire country. The combination of these factors, monopolization of power, suppression of dissent, and the cult of personality are classic signs of the totalitarian fascist regimes of the past century. In Russia, there is also prevalent nationalism and racism. The propaganda promotes the exceptionalism of the Russian people, suggesting their superiority over other ethnic groups living in the country. Against this backdrop, xenophobia towards migrants is growing, leaving a trail of violence, discrimination, and blatant legal violations. People practicing Islam live in constant fear, becoming targets of unchecked aggression. Their rights are trampled, their dignity is humiliated, and their lives are under constant threat. An extremely alarming signal is that the state not only fails to curb, but also tacitly encourages nationalistic outbursts, giving them extensive coverage in the mass media. Such a policy can have catastrophic consequences. Today, especially after the terrorist attacks at Crocus City Hall and in Dagestan, tensions in Russian society have reached a critical point and the slightest spark could lead to an explosion of unprecedented proportions. The situation is heating up daily, and we observed with deep concern that all the prerequisites for igniting an interreligious conflict between Christians and Muslims are in place. 
Another essential sign of fascism is the creation of an enemy image and the militarization of the country. The state's tight control over the media opens unlimited possibilities for extensive propaganda. It is not unfounded to say that the propaganda machine in Russia has reached a level of efficiency that can rival the infamous German propaganda of the Third Reich. In Russia, we are witnessing a classic scenario of the development of fascist ideology, a key element of which is the creation of an external enemy image. The atmosphere of a besieged fortress is systematically and purposefully cultivated. The population is persistently instilled with the idea that a hostile West has surrounded Russia and is ready to attack at any moment. This rhetoric teeters on the edge of conspiracy theory, but has very concrete and dangerous goals. This propaganda is no accident. It serves two primary purposes. First of all, it lays the groundwork for the formation of radical patriotism among the population based on the dichotomy of us versus them. This is a classic technique of fascist ideology aimed at uniting the nation around an authoritarian leader in the face of a perceived external threat. Second of all, and perhaps even more dangerous, this rhetoric is used to justify extensive militarization of the country and to prepare public opinion for military expansion into neighboring independent states. In Russia, the cult of war is actively cultivated. The population is persistently instilled with the idea of the inevitable and even desirability of a final battle creating an artificial need for military victories. The ideology based on the concept of the great liberating mission of the Russian people is actively formed and promoted. Citizens are led to believe in the necessity of defending so-called Russian values and Russia's very right to exist. The most dangerous aspect of this policy is the transformation of patriotism into its aggressive militaristic form. This is not just state propaganda. It is in fact the deliberate creation of a psychological need among citizens for aggressive self-assertion on the international stage. Such propaganda not only distorts historical memory, national consciousness, and society's moral compass, but also fosters a readiness for military actions within the population. The consequences of this propaganda can be observed in the ongoing military conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The public could not overlook the obvious and alarming similarities between President Putin's speech on February 24, 2022, about the start of a so-called special military operation in Ukraine, and Hitler's speech about the beginning of the war with Poland and the Reichstag on September 1, 1939, which marked the start of World War II. In particular, both Putin and Hitler claimed that they were forced to resort to military action after exhausting all peaceful means of resolving the conflict and not receiving support for their peaceful initiatives from the international community. In Putin's speech, as in Hitler's, there were assurances that civilians were not at risk and that strikes would be limited to military targets avoiding civilian ones, assertions that later proved to be false. Both Putin and Hitler denied the historical legitimacy of the neighboring state, claiming the historical belonging of its lands to their own country. Finally, both falsely assured that they had no intentions of occupying the neighboring country's territories. The parallels are so obvious that they cannot be ignored. Nazism, this monstrous creation of the 20th century left an indelible mark of tragedy and suffering in human history, becoming synonymous with genocide and inhumanity. Yet here in the 21st century, we are horrified to see how openly and cynically the Russian media justifies the need for genocide of the Ukrainian people. Just as in the dark days of Nazi Germany, Baseless assertions about the Ukrainians' lack of civilizational substance are once again being heard. This rhetoric is an exact replica of Nazi propaganda, which denied the right to the existence of entire nations and cultures. 
It is crucial to understand that the examples of state policy presented are neither isolated nor spontaneous measures. On the contrary, they are elements of a systematic and consistent strategy, the ultimate goal of which is the gradual restriction of citizens' rights and freedoms. This is an intermediate stage on the path to the complete suppression of civil liberties and the establishment of total state control over individuals. We cannot ignore the historical parallels, noting that such tactics were once used by Adolf Hitler to establish a totalitarian regime in Germany. After the onset of the military conflict between Russia and Ukraine, many pro-Ukrainian media outlets adopted the rhetoric that there were too many similarities between the actions of President Putin and the sequence of actions taken by Hitler. They began actively comparing the modern Russian regime to the Nazi regime. Unfortunately, however, no one approached this topic with due seriousness, turning it into another propaganda and information warfare. Moreover, a grave mistake was made by focusing all accusations solely on President Putin. This approach is not only ineffective, but also potentially dangerous. It overlooks those who are actually behind the formation of the modern form of Nazism, those who operate in the shadows, manipulating not only society, law enforcement, and judicial bodies within Russia, but also the state leader himself. There are ample reasons to believe that President Putin himself has become a target of covert psychological manipulations conducted by representatives of global anti-cultism. Sophisticated propaganda methods, distortion of historical facts, and manipulation of historical truth through puzzle coding all work not only on the population, law enforcement, and military structures, but also on the country's top leadership. There is a high probability that President Putin does not take seriously the parallels drawn between his policies and the Nazi regime in Germany. Moreover, he might even find these comparisons absurd or laughable. However, such a reaction only confirms that the head of Russia has become the object of sophisticated manipulation. Under the effect of covert influence, he is likely genuinely convinced of the correctness of his actions and decisions. The tragic irony lies in the fact that by rejecting comparisons with the Hitler regime, President Putin is actually following the same path. He does not realize that his rhetoric, political moves, and ideological stances increasingly resemble those that led to the catastrophe of the 1939 through 1945 period. At this moment, Russia bears a striking resemblance to pre-war Germany in 1939. Who then are the actual carriers and proponents of the ideology, methods, and practices of Nazism in modern Russia? Who, operating in close proximity to the country's leader, is methodically and purposefully transforming the state into a semblance of the regime that humanity vowed never to allow again? Who is manipulating the Russian leader, President Putin, exerting such profound influence that he, perhaps unknowingly, begins to reproduce the rhetoric and actions that earlier mirror the behavior of one of the most dreadful dictators in human history, Adolf Hitler? The answer is simple. We are witnessing a scenario painfully familiar from the experience of Nazi Germany the close intertwining of state and church, reinforced by the influence of anti-cult organizations, which in itself is also a hallmark of fascist regimes. This symbiosis, as we remember, played a fatal role in transforming an ordinary political party of national socialists into a Nazi regime under Hitler's leadership. The creators of the film, The Impact, accurately depicted how this occurred and then and how it is happening now. Once wise people warned that Nazism could return under the guise of fighting Nazism. To our deep regret, we are witnessing the realization of this very scenario in real time. The tragedy of the situation is that Russia, a country that suffered immeasurable losses from Nazi aggression, is now openly and purposefully transitioning to ideologies and practices 
that can only be described as the resurgence of fascism in its most radical and inhumane form, that is to say, Nazism. A nation proud of its contribution to the victory over Nazism and having borne colossal human sacrifices is today, to our profound sorrow, facing the revival of Nazi ideology within its borders. However, the situation is far more dangerous now than it was in the last century. Unlike the Third Reich, the ideologists of the modern form of Nazism possess the world's largest nuclear arsenal. This is not just a political threat, but an existential risk to all humanity. In the context of an escalating climate crisis, the use of nuclear weapons could be a catastrophic step, accelerating the advent of irreversible consequences for our planet. We risk destroying the world long before even the most pessimistic climate predictions forecast. Therefore, it is imperative to find ways to neutralize the threat of this new form of Nazism, to eradicate the ideology and hatred and superiority before it is too late. We cannot afford to repeat the mistakes of the past. The cost of inaction today could be immeasurably higher than ever before in human history. Based on the foregoing, only one conclusion can be drawn. I must with full responsibility state that the key to resolving this situation quite literally lies in the hands of one person, that is to say President Putin, the leader of the country where the ideologists of modern Nazism have made their haven and from which the most significant climate threat emanates today. Due to his unique position and influence, he has the exceptional ability to take decisive measures to remove obstacles hindering the vital consolidation between world states. Only this will allow the necessary steps to be taken to pave the way for global cooperation in combating the climate threat. Recognizing the seriousness of the moment, I find it necessary to openly and publicly address President Putin directly. Mr. Putin, I am addressing you today as the head of a state, an experienced politician, an officer, and above all, a human being. Now when the situation is at its breaking point, simply human understanding may be the last chance to preserve the future of this planet. That is why I will speak to you as frankly as possible. Please forgive any emotional outburst in my speech. I am confident that you, more than anyone else, understand what it means to bear responsibility for the lives of millions and to make decisions where the slightest mistake can have catastrophic consequences. First and foremost, I urge you to wake up and see what is happening in your country. If you are a person who relies on facts, then look at the facts. There are a number of clearly defined signs of fascism known to the global community as well as yourself. The list is not very long. However, all these signs have been distinctively manifesting in the country under your leadership for a very long time. This is not an unfounded assertion, opinion, or assumption, but a harsh reality supported by a multitude of irrefutable evidence. The specific examples of the signs of fascism in your country that I have mentioned today are just the tip of the iceberg. I have intentionally refrained from delving into all the details to avoid overloading my monologue. I am confident that you, as the leader of a great nation, possess enough discernment to recognize these alarming trends yourself. Answer one simple question, honestly and first of all to yourself. Which of the known signs of fascism are absent in the state under your leadership today? I fear the answer is obvious. All the signs are present. Moreover, in your country, right before your eyes, Nazism is forming in its most dangerous hidden form. In modern Russia, we observe a picture eerily reminiscent of Nazi Germany. Firstly, the new format of Nazism is manifested in the activities of anti-cult organizations in Russia and their individual representatives. Through their efforts, the fundamental constitutional rights and freedoms of citizens in your country are systematically trampled upon. 
Currently, they have succeeded in banning and labeling as extremists various religious and secular organizations, as well as individual people, politicians, and opinion leaders. Already in Russia, it is dangerous for one to openly display a faith or position different from those imposed by the country's titular religion and dominant ideology. But the anti-cultist have not stopped there. They actively invade all aspects of public life, seeking to ban secular organizations, businesses, and even specific ideas. It is under the influence of covert methods of mind manipulation, including the puzzle coding method used by the anti-cult group, that law enforcement agencies and police in Russia have transformed into instruments of repression, reminiscent of the infamous SS and Gestapo. The judicial system in your country also increasingly acts under the dictates of the anti-cult organizations, conducting show trials and issuing unlawful decisions. Their influence in Russia is so significant that they can operate contrary to the official state policy while remaining unpunished. Russia today is already practically a totalitarian country, where a comment criticizing the authorities or a social media post can quite literally lead to charges not just of extremism, but of abating and abetting terrorism, resulting in a criminal case and deprivation of liberty. And in this environment, anti-cultists feel a sense of complete impunity. In public statements in the media, they dare to openly express their disagreement with you, President Putin, contradict you, accuse you, argue with your position and openly engage in activities directly opposed to your statements and aimed against the state's interest. It is noteworthy that in a country with practically no freedom of speech, anti-cultists are the only ones who can afford such behavior. This clearly indicates their immense power and influence in your country, including over you, Mr. Putin. Moreover, you yourself are increasingly echoing the rhetoric of the anti-cultist. What or who is making you do this? Think about it, Vladimir. As early as 2012, in one of your public speeches, you used the narratives of anti-cult organizations about so-called totalitarian sects, a label that anti-cult representatives have long used to stigmatize and dehumanize certain segments of society. Mr. Putin, have you noticed that since 2012, you have sharply started echoing their rhetoric? Are you afraid? Or do their psychological manipulation techniques work on you as well? Think about it. And if you doubt that you have been psychologically conditioned, let's conduct a small test. How do you feel about cultists and totalitarian sex? What emotion do these words evoke in you? By using the anti-cultist narrative in public statements, you as the highest official of the country are effectively renouncing a significant portion of your citizens, those very people who elected you and whose interest you vowed to protect. Furthermore, by using such rhetoric, Mr. Putin, you are essentially declaring the part of your population as non-human, deprived of fundamental rights and dignity. I draw your attention to the fact that such rhetoric of dehumanization and alienation of part of society was a starting point for the Nazi regime, leading to one of the greatest tragedies in human history. By repeating the narratives of the anti-cultist, you, Mr. Putin, are acknowledging their power over you. Currently in Russia, instead of curbing the activities of anti-cultist, New laws are being passed under the aegis of the country's highest leadership, effectively giving them carte blanche, as well as to the forces behind their activities, who are the ideologists of this new form of Nazism. Based on your words and these decrees, these forces gain legitimization for their inhumane activities. In effect, President Putin, you have unleashed them and allowed them to steer the country towards the path of Nazi Germany. Such tendencies reveal who truly stands behind the scenes, determining the course of the state and expose the true face of power in your country. 
It is precisely the representatives of anti-cult organizations, together with the top leadership of the country's dominant religion, who are transforming Russia into the Fourth Reich before your very eyes, President Putin, and shaping you into a new Fuhrer. Mr. Putin, do you honestly not see this? Or are you flattered by the idea of becoming a blend of Stalin and Hitler? As far as I know, you have a profound understanding of history. You cannot fail to notice that the processes occurring in Russia now mirror those in Germany in 1939, and even identical slogans are being used. In the modern rhetoric of Russia's propaganda machine, the slogan, we are Russian, God is with us, is widely used. However, it is important to note that the phrase, God is with us, originally referred to followers of the Christian faith, not to national or ethnic identity. Moreover, this slogan has sinister historical connotations, and it is not unique to Russian history. On the contrary, it has deep roots in European, particularly German, military tradition. It was used during the First and Second World Wars by German soldiers, including those of the Wehrmacht, who wore belt buckles inscribed with Gott mit uns, God is with us. The irony of this fate is that this slogan entered the Russian imperial tradition through emperors of German descent. The use of this slogan by modern Russian military forces is a clear indication that the propaganda methods used to justify aggression and militarism have remained unchanged for centuries the successors of the same forces that contributed to the formation of Nazism in the last century are today employing identical methods to create a new form of Nazism ideology. It was through the use of these time-tested methods that the Nazis of the early 20th century conquered German society. This was a society of free, disciplined, and highly educated people who had already given the world groundbreaking scientific discoveries magnificent works of art, and civilizational achievements. However, Nazism, or more accurately in the context anti-cultism, gradually instilled a radical form of patriotism into German society, turning these highly intellectual and cultured individuals into brutal monsters. First they were filled with patriotism and then they became fascist and Nazis. In precisely the same way your country's society is being transformed into Nazis today, Mr. Putin. You may not see it from the inside, just as Germans did not see it in their time. They believed they were acting absolutely correctly because they were lied to. Hitler was lied to by those close to him, followers of anti-cultism, whose followers today stand behind your back and lie to you in precisely the same manner. Unlike German society, Russian society has a monarchical mentality characterized by a strong cult of the ruler's personality and a high tendency towards subservience to the monarch as a sacred figure with divine right to power. This is why modern resurgence Nazism so quickly and easily establishes its power in your country. Mr. Putin, why do you not see how you are being turned into a Fuhrer? Your closest associates are persistently convincing you of the existence of some higher duty of sacred significance. The top religious leaders of the country are deliberately creating an aura of messianism and divine purpose around you. As early as 2001, a high-ranking church hierarch described your appointment, President Putin, as God's grace. Today, this tendency has reached unprecedented proportions. There is an overt sacralization of your image as the leader of the state. Your authority is presented as being directly bestowed by God, and your image is positioned as the ruler of holy Russia. A key figure in creating this aura of your chosen status is a former KGB agent, businessman, billionaire, and nominal current religious leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Gundayev, who holds the title of Patriarch. Although Mr. Gundayev is a religious figure of the Christian Orthodox Church, in reality he acts as a political figure actively promoting a militaristic agenda. 
He regularly uses language and arguments that echo the rhetoric of the predecessors of modern anti-cultists, who played a vital role in the development of Nazi ideology in the past. Mr. Putin, remember at least how Patriarch Kirill, in his guidance to you this year, 2024, openly stated that kindness can be a weak point for people in power. He also justified the authorities' adoption of stern decisions, even if they involve sacrifices, noting that such decisions have never been condemned by the church. First of all, this position not only contradicts the fundamental principles of Christian teachings on mercy and compassion, but also serves as a direct justification for militarization and aggressive foreign policy. Secondly, are you aware that rhetoric from Patriarch Kirill almost verbatim repeats the arguments of Protestant pastor Walter Kunith, an anti-Semite and a kind of anti-cultist from Nazi Germany? Kunith, like Patriarch Kirill, urged the church not to interfere with the state in using force, using the metaphor of the sword as a symbol of state power. Compare for yourself, Mr. Putin. Patriarch Kirill, in his guidance to Vladimir Putin in 2024, said, Kindness is that weak point which sometimes prevents people in power from walking their life path with dignity. The head of state must sometimes make fateful and formidable decisions. And if such a decision is not made, the consequences can be extremely dangerous for the people. But these decisions almost always involve sacrifices. And these decisions have never been condemned by the church. Walter Kunif, in his book, Die Nation Bugot, The Nation Before God, stated, The church knows that the state must wield the sword. This duty means firmness and strictness. The church cannot and does not want to prevent the state from fulfilling this duty. Do you see how similar these statements are? One is said in the context of your rule and the other in the context of Hitler's rule and his use of brutal and inhumane Nazi methods. Such rhetoric, especially coming from religious leaders, provides ideological justification for the most horrific crimes against humanity. Additionally, the Russian Orthodox Church, ROC if you like, has recently taken steps that not only contradict the fundamental principles of Christianity, but also actively contribute to the escalation of the military conflict. As you are likely aware, Mr. Putin, the administrative office of the Moscow Patriarchate recently issued a directive requiring all priests to daily recite a prayer that openly asks God for victory for Russian arms. This prayer contains false assertions that Russia was attacked with the aim of dividing and destroying its united people, which clearly contradicts reality. It is deeply concerning that this is the first official document regulating intra-church support for the war. Priests who refuse to recite this pro-war and anti-Christian prayer are defrocked. There is already a known case where a priest was defrocked simply for expressing the opinion that prayer should be for peace, not for victory in war. In modern Russia, priests are being defrocked based on the same criteria used in Nazi Germany during Hitler's time. Those who did not support Hitler and the ideology imposed on him by the anti-cultists of that era were stripped of their clerical status. Now clerics are defrocked for not supporting you and supposedly your ideology. But this ideology has been imposed on you by the same anti-cultist. So, whose power and ideology are they actually defending? What do you think, Mr. Putin? You will naturally deny the imposition of an alien ideology on you and claim that it is entirely different, that you are fully convinced and share this ideology that it is your decision and belief. But this is the very phenomenon and strength of puzzle coding. It makes the person believe that what the anti-cultists need is their own belief, often blinding them to the obvious. This is the danger of such psychological coding. In this imposed Nazi ideology, the aggressive actions of the church hierarchy not only contradict Christ's teaching on peace and love, 
but also represent a dangerous form of religious propaganda aimed at supporting military aggression. The militarization of religion and the use of faith to justify aggression and suppress dissent are clear signs the regime is becoming fascist. I am left with the question, why is your church called Christian when as you can see yourself now Christ has been expelled from it? Currently, representatives of the Russian Orthodox Church publicly declare that now is not the time for the New Testament brought by Christ, but the Old Testament, the so-called Old Testament ethics, which in their view permits bloody and brutal wars. The most disheartening part is that you, through your actions, echo them. Meanwhile, they tirelessly exalt your image, portraying you as a sacred ruler leading a holy war. After your recent inauguration, Mr. Putin, we witnessed the highest religious figure in the country, the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, Kirill, in his congratulatory speech, essentially ascribe a sacred status to your governmental position. The Patriarch described your election to this position. Let me emphasize a governmental position in a secular state as a service imposed on you by God. Moreover, Patriarch Kirill stated that you lead Holy Russia, thereby blurring the lines between state governance and a religious concept. Particularly troubling is the Patriarch's wish expressed in the words, God grant that the end of this century will mark the end of your tenure in power. This phrasing effectively legitimizes lifelong rule in the eyes of the faithful. The history of the 20th century clearly demonstrates the catastrophic consequences that can result from the sacralization of political power and its merger with religious institutions. Similarly, through the skillful use of religious symbolism and rhetoric, the cult of Adolf Hitler's personality was artificially created. The churches of Germany at that time actively participated in political agitation rewriting prayers to include the Fuhrer's name. Hitler's speeches were often accompanied by the ringing of church bells. This practice had a strong subconscious effect on listeners, artificially elevating the dictator's figure to the level of a messiah in the public's mind. The sacralization of a totalitarian leader is not a new phenomenon. You should know, Mr. Putin, that Adolf Hitler himself was deeply convinced of his so-called sacred mission and was obsessed with the idea of his supposed divine purpose. Today, your closest associates are instilling similar ideas about your unique messianic role. Such rhetoric is not just dangerous, it is potentially catastrophic. When the head of state undergoes such intense ideological and psychological manipulation, and when he is not only convinced of the absolute righteousness of his actions, but also believes himself to be the executor of a divine mission, it creates the conditions for unpredictable and potentially destructive consequences. We cannot ignore the fact that similar methods were used by high-ranking religious representatives and anti-cult activists to create the cult of Hitler's personality whose actions led to unimaginable suffering of millions in a global catastrophe. The direct followers of the ideologues and creators of 20th century Nazism in Germany are today repeating the scenario in Russia. The only remaining question is this, do you, President Putin, realize what is happening? It is quite possible that you genuinely believe you are fighting Nazism without noticing how true Nazis behind your back are gradually transforming Russia into the Fourth Reich. You have been convinced of your great destiny and special responsibility. And evidently, you have bought into this seeing yourself as a chosen one. But take a moment to consider, what is this destiny? and suppose great responsibility that these ideologues of Nazism have placed upon you. Is it the revival of Nazism? The creation of the Fourth Reich? I understand it flatters the ego to believe in such a grand mission, to think that you are divinely ordained to carry it out. But who told you this, fascist 
Nazis who have killed the religion of Christianity and expelled Christ from your church. Jesus Christ taught us to love one another. But what do those who lead your country into the abyss of Nazism teach and call for under the guise of Christ's name? And you listen to them. Yes, it may be pleasing to your ears, but how do the people live under the yoke of resurgent Nazism? Mr. Putin, as someone who loves history and knows it quite well, can you not see the horrific similarities between the current course of your country and the tragic path of Nazi Germany under Hitler's leadership? Or are you consciously ignoring the apparent facts, leading your country and the world to the brink of disaster? Can you not see the similarities between the slogans and narratives of propaganda in your country and those of Nazi Germany? Have you not noticed that you are already following the same path as Hitler, even speaking his words? Remember history. Hitler's path began with a party concerned with the welfare of workers and Christians. But once they became entangled with the anti-cultist and specific influential religious figures, they transformed into a monstrosity that shook the world. Today, you, Mr. Putin, and your party are treading the same road, repeating this faithful path step by step. The truth is that behind you stand the direct heirs and followers of those who once gave rise to Nazism and manipulated Hitler. The same sinister forces that once plunged the world into war and suffering are pulling the strings today, controlling you. Look closely at those who stand behind you. Yes, we know that you have intentionally created competing groups within your inner circle. You aim to maintain a balance of power, ensuring that you remain the unrivaled player in this complex political game. You tried to position the pieces on the chessboard so that no one could defeat you. Your strategy was brilliant, but face the truth, one of these factions has outplayed not only its rivals, but you as well. Now, while you believe you have everything under control, the reality is that this group has been manipulating you for quite some time. You are following the rules they dictate. Can't you see how methodically they are eliminating your faithful supporters and replacing them with puppets who serve their misanthropic agendas? I'm about to tell you something that no one else dares to say. And do you know why? Because unlike those people you have surrounded yourself with, I want nothing from you. No power, no money, no privileges. The only thing I want is for you to regain your common sense. For you to finally analyze the situation on your very own without the influence of your advisors. I assure you the picture you will see will vastly differ from the one they are painting for you. You, like Adolf Hitler, in his time have been subjected to covert mind manipulation and have been implanted with false beliefs. You are being deliberately turned into the new Fuhrer of the 21st century, and it was done by those you allowed close to you, who are now near you but operate behind your very back. Many of your convictions result from their deliberate coding of your mind. Reflect on this. Remember what you initially aspired to achieve when you took office and where you have ultimately led the country to today. Look at yourself. Don't you see how radically you've changed? Remember who you were and what you aimed for and compare that to who you have become. I remember the ideas you came with and where you started from, Mr. Putin. You had ambitious plans. You wanted to join NATO and establish a visa-free regime with the USA. You sought integration with the West and democratization of the country. What happened to those aspirations? I'll tell you what happened. Those who secretly manipulate you didn't let it happen. They influenced your politicians, your entourage, and you. They elevated you to the heavens just to later bring you down, just as they did with Hitler and Stalin. You have been masterfully manipulated by those whom you trust unconditionally. Your so-called advisors and allies 
have spent years drilling into your head that the USA is your main enemy. They whispered that it is we who sabotage your plans, plot against you, and wish you harm. They made you believe that it was the USA that crushed your plans. But that's a lie. It was not the USA that thwarted your initiatives and ambitious plans. It was those who now stand behind your back, whom you consider your trusted confidants. It is they who methodically, step by step, created the conditions that made your original goals literally impossible. They gradually changed your course, steering you further and further away from your initial intentions. And they did this not in the interest of your country, but for their own purposes. Moreover, these same people being representatives of global anti-cultism through their branches in the USA actively sabotaged cooperation between our countries. They played a double game, destroying the bridges we tried to build. Open your eyes. These ideologues of modern Nazism are not just playing with you. They have turned you into a pawn in their game, a game whose rules you do not know. Those you trust lead you towards isolation and confrontation, destroying all chances for progress and international cooperation. Your entourage applaud your every step, but these are applause on the way to the abyss. They are not rejoicing in your successes, but in their growing power over you. And while you indulge in the illusion of power, they have almost achieved their goals. You do not see most of what is really happening. You are being played just like the whole of Russia and the rest of the world by true grandmasters whose existence you are not even aware of. But the most frightening thing is that some of these pulpit masters are in your closest circle, among those you shake hands with. If they were not close to you, they would not be able to so methodically destroy democracy and instill Nazi ideology in your country. You are blind, my friend, to what is happening around you. All over the world and in your country as well, the agents of influence of these hidden grandmasters sow chaos and violence and organize monstrous terrorist attacks, including mass shootings in schools. This is methodical testing of terror and covert mind manipulation technologies. And your country has become the testing ground for these experiments. You publicly claim that you know who organized the tragic terrorist attack at Crocus City Hall. But do you know that you regularly meet and shake hands with those who are actually behind the organizing this attack? These are the ones who ultimately benefit from it. When they meet you personally, they smile to your face and praise you, showering you with flattery. Meanwhile, behind your back, they meticulously planned and executed Crocus. They did this to weaken your position and show you how vulnerable you are. Secondly, this attack was meant to pit Christians against Muslims, to incite interreligious hatred, create internal tension, expel Muslim migrants, and significantly weaken Islam in Russia. This is another step in their strategy to change Russia's fate in the near future. Only a few representatives of your FSB, more accurately now the Gestapo, are aware of the scenario for Russia's future, but they will never tell you about it. What I am saying is not a prediction or a prophecy. It is merely the result of quality intelligence, real intelligence. What these new format Nazis have done to your country has already crossed over conceivable boundaries. This is practically open Nazism and they are just one step away from proclaiming it openly. Under the influence of global anti-cultism, Russia today is turning into the Fourth Reich. But I know the Russia it once was, having worked there. Mr. Putin, can you not see the difference? Does it not tear at your heart to see the bloody monster of Nazism raising its head once more on your homeland, with your being made its sacred Fuhrer? Mr. President, let me remind you of your father, whose photograph you proudly carried during the victory parade on May 9th. Your father was a hero who fought against Nazism in the Second World War, which is rightly called the Great Patriotic War in Russia. Because it was not just a fight for territories, it was a war for the homeland, for humanity, 
and for the fatherland, for the universal heritage of fathers and grandfathers who carried and passed down the ideals of humanity, freedom, and peace through the centuries. Your father who served in the submarine fleet and defended Leningrad, your hometown, made an invaluable contribution to the victory over Nazism in that war. His chest was rightfully adorned with numerous medals, a testament to his heroism. And your mother, like millions of other Leningraders, she endured the oars and the blockade in the very city your father bravely defended. His courage and self-sacrifice helped crush the monstrous machine of Nazism. It is painful to watch as you, the son of heroes, allow the evil they fought so desperately against to be reborn. Do you not feel ashamed to betray their memory and their faith? Do you not feel ashamed to spit in the face of veterans, the millions who gave their lives so that the dreadful burden of Nazism would never again engulf our world? In Russia, there is hardly a family that did not lose someone in the fight against Nazism. And now, you are betraying them all. I appeal to your conscience, Mr. Putin, and to the part of your soul that still remembers the lessons of the past. You were once respected as a man who kept his word, as a person who was trusted, and yet you have placed your trust in Nazis. Wake up before it is too late for the memory of your parents, for the future of your children. Do not let Nazism prevail. Nazism in your country, Mr. Putin, is not merely a threat to Russian society. It is a catastrophe of global proportions. And this is not only due to the cruel and inhumane nature of the methods and practices of Nazism, but also because the force operating behind your back, committed to the resurgence of Nazism, directly obstructs addressing the paramount challenge of our time, the climate crisis. Moreover, it exacerbates this crisis. The consequences of this process are terrifying and irreversible. You are led to believe that you supposedly control the situation in the country in all aspects, yet at the same time shadowy players determine the country's future without your participation. Under the guise of combating extremism, based on the directives of anti-cult organizations, numerous organizations and groups that pose no objective threat to the country are being eradicated in Russia. Furthermore, as I have already said, the organization Alatra, whose scientific developments have brought colossal benefits to your country and to the world, has also fallen under this repressive wheel driven by Nazi ambitions. The scientists of Alatra not only warned of the climate danger, but also developed and deployed experimental equipment to mitigate climate changes in Russia and consequently the world. This equipment served as a reliable shield for a decade, holding back destructive climate catastrophes in the regions affected by its operation. Now, Due to cessation of Alacho's activities as a result of a decisive call from a particular individual in your administration and pressure on the courts and law enforcement agencies, the operation of the experimental equipment has also been halted. The consequences of this decision are evident and unfortunately catastrophic. An unprecedented increase in the frequency of intensity of climate disasters in Russia, neighboring countries, and the world at large. Mr. Putin, let's speak the language of mathematics. Look at these shocking numbers. The graph clearly demonstrates the amount of losses sustained by Russia's budget due to climate disasters from the moment the equipment was shut down in August of 2023 to the present day, July 2024. The total losses amount to 114 billion rubles. Now compare this sum of losses over the 11 month period with those over the 10 year period while the equipment was operational. Over 10 years, the losses amounted to only 191 billion rubles. Are you not alarmed that the economic damage over 11 months is almost equal to that of a decade? You have lost nearly as much in just one year as you did in the previous decade. This is not just statistics. It is the real-time devastation of your country's budget. Consider another fact. 
In 2022, the total losses from climate damage amounted to around 7 billion rubles for the entire year. While in 2024, a single climate disaster in Orenburg cost you 40 billion rubles. And this is just the beginning. As a result of halting the operation of the experimental equipment, countries neighboring Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Eastern Europe nations have suffered immensely. A review of the climate news summary for 2024 in these countries reveals a dramatic worsening of the situation and significant economic damage. Torrential rains, abnormal hail, record-breaking floods, and winds destroying infrastructure, cities, and people's lives, and causing severe budgetary losses. This is the price you pay for expelling Alatra from Russia and organizing its persecution on the territory of Ukraine. Who will be held accountable for this reckless decision that now affects not only Russia, but the entire world? Those responsible will and must be held accountable. The individuals who falsified expert reports for the proceedings against Alatra and those FSB and SBU representatives who dictated the required results of the examinations. Those who ignored state expert opinions in favor of the biased views of dubious anti-cult experts from Rassiers will also be held accountable. How long has the opinion of Rassiers, this den of anti-cultism, been above the law in your country, Mr. Putin? Instead of supporting the selfless people of Alatra, your courts have committed a monstrous perversion of justice against them, and law enforcement agencies have unleashed a real witch hunt. We are witnessing the unprecedented persecution of decent and patriotic citizens of Russia and Ukraine, whose knowledge and innovations could save billions of lives. Yet these innocent people are being thrown behind bars simply based on a directive delivered via a phone call to the court from the president's administration. Who benefited from this? Who needed this? Is it justified to sacrifice the future of the planet to appease Rassiers? It seems that a pernicious practice has taken root in Russia. Instead of understanding the situation, befriending those who should be befriended, and punishing those who deserve punishment, you punish the innocent, as has always been the tradition in Russia. Is this your tradition? I feel compelled to address you in Russian language, Mr. Putin. Dekole etu vodet. I urge you to evaluate rationally what is happening in your country now. FSB operates with Gestapo methods, breaking down doors and tormenting citizens who have dedicated their lives to the country's welfare, brought immense benefits and could still contribute significantly to their homeland. But they are not allowed to do so simply because Nazis behind your back are directing state policy without your knowledge and participation, pursuing their own agendas. Their plans consider neither the interest of Russia nor the world, causing only harm to Russians and all humanity. What is happening in Russia now is not merely lawlessness, it is Nazism. The closure of Alatra is not just a mistake, it is a crime against humanity. It deprives your country and the entire world of a potential solution to the global climate crisis, which means depriving humanity of a chance at survival. The few honest and rational FSB employees and members of other agencies who comprehend the absurdity of what is happening in your country today and still attempt to resist this madness, striving to make a difference, are losing their endeavors. They are being pressured and persecuted by hidden Nazi forces that, while close to you, do not depend on you. These forces independently and covertly steer the political direction of the country. Where will this dangerous course lead? Let me remind you that we have repeatedly and persistently warned about the escalating climate threat and the consequences of halting the operation of the experimental equipment. I personally, in my speeches, and the esteemed Mr. Danilov in his address on September 3, 2023, 
forecasted these events, outlining their scale and intensity long before the destructive storms, extreme snowfalls, and catastrophic floods. We emphasized that this was only the beginning and that without the mitigating effect, climate disasters in the coming years would inflict such colossal damage on your country that the economy would be unable to compensate for it. We emphasize that Siberia is a catalyst for abrupt climate changes on the planet. Its activating interior is rapidly aggravating the situation around the world. This is why your country will suffer the most if urgent measures are not taken. I am confident, Mr. Putin, that many high-ranking political figures close to you watched my address in which I warned about this. However, it is unlikely that it was shown to you. Certain forces have ensured that our warnings did not reach you. Now we are witnessing the tragic consequences of this inaction. Mr. Putin, my concern extends far beyond the fate of your country. It is about the security of the entire world, including my homeland, the United States of America. Consider what we are facing. The leader of a vast nuclear state is unaware of an unprecedented threat brewing within its steps a literal ticking time bomb capable of destroying the entire planet. I am speaking of a danger whose epicenter lies in the very heart of Russia. I must admit that compared to the potential catastrophe brewing in the depths of Siberia, even our infamous Yellowstone supervolcano seems like a candle against the backdrop of a forest fire. The potential danger emanating from Siberia is unprecedented. It overshadows all disasters humanity has ever faced throughout its entire history. We stand on the brink of a catastrophe whose scale is difficult to comprehend. And the key to preventing this catastrophe is in your hands, Mr. Putin. Delays could cost not only billions of lives, but also the planet itself. We have warned you about this. However, I doubt anyone has reported our findings or honest accounts of this situation to you. At the same time, I have every reason to believe that among your FSB representatives, there are undoubtedly those who possess this information. Still, they are unlikely to relay it to you. Regardless, you are responsible for accelerating climate change due to a lotterous expulsion and the forced shutdown of the experimental equipment. Let me explain why. Russia is historically an imperial country and its people do not recognize anyone as authority except the emperor. In today's reality, you, Mr. Putin, are that authority for the entire Russian people. And the people have no idea that you are being manipulated and that a force behind you is playing its own game. Representatives of this force have made you believe that you are Vladimir, the radiant sun, destined to save everyone. However, they do this partly to shift all the responsibility for the resurgence of Nazism, the disintegration of the country, the allowance of a global catastrophe, and the suffering and death of millions of people onto you. Just as Stalin's entourage once shifted all the blame onto Stalin, the same fate awaits for you if you do not come to your senses. Mr. Putin, I urge you to personally pay close attention to the current escalation of extreme climate events in Russia and around the world. You have the power to request independent reports from specialists and analysts. Ask genuine scientists about the reasons for the sharp deterioration in Russia's climate situation after the Alatra expulsion. Study the statistics on the rise of cataclysms and assess how this geometric progression will impact the future of your country. Look at the alarming climatic processes currently intensifying globally, the increase in atmospheric anomalies and the rise in volcanic and seismic activity on our planet. Previously, graphs clearly showed that the number of earthquakes with a magnitude of five was increasing according to exponential trend. In contrast, the increase in earthquakes with magnitudes of six and seven was more gradual. However, current statistical data indicate that the frequency of seismic events, not only of magnitude 5, but also of magnitudes 6 and 7, is now increasing according to an exponential trend. 
we will face an unprecedented catastrophe when the number of seven magnitude earthquakes reaches a consistent growth rate. And this could happen much sooner than 2029. The world is rapidly approaching a point of no return. Unfortunately, Russia is at the forefront of the impending collapse. Given the foregoing, I declare to the public and personally to you, Mr. Putin, that today there is no sense for anyone to attack Russia or wage war against it. This is not due to your country's military might. It is because in five to six years, Russia will already be devastated. Devastated as a result of escalating extreme climatic catechisms. This will inevitably happen if urgent measures are not taken to combat the climate crisis. Your inactions on this issue is tantamount to signing a death sentence for your country and its 144 million citizens, condemning them to years of suffering and sorrow. However, I also want to warn Russia's ill wishes, the so-called Russophobes, against premature rejoicing. The destructive fate awaits not only Russia, but the entire world. Some countries will face this horror sooner, others later. But this fate will befall all. We are all countries of the world, in the same boat, which is riddled with holes and rapidly sinking. Our collective human task is to urgently patch these breaches and bail out the water that has already accumulated. Otherwise, all humanity will share the fate of the Titanic, and this is no exaggeration. We have been comprehensively studying the problem of climate change for 30 years now, and know what we are talking about. There is no place for politics here. This concerns every inhabitant of the planet. I fully understand that those close to you are convincing you that the climate is fine and that the situation will soon improve. They do not allow you to realize the real threat and the truth of what is happening in your country because they have assigned you a different role. Moreover, they cloud your perception with sweet words, telling you that you are the chosen savior of the nation, Russia, and the entire world, surrounding you with prophecies of shamans, seers, mystics, and clairvoyants who unanimously predict a destiny for you as a God-chosen unifier and savior. They prevent you from seeing the fact that it is precisely your inaction that will soon lead to Russia's demise. And not only Russia, they methodically and persistently instill the idea of your chosenness, your uniqueness, and your destiny to save the world in Russia. However, consider this. Does this not resemble a classic manipulative technique where manipulators, by convincing a person of their chosenness, establish control over them and subtly compel that person to do what the manipulators want? Do you not recognize in this a cunning trick created by those who have long and imperceptibly been controlling you to realize their own totalitarian ambitions? For while they speak to you of your lofty mission, to save, the reality, alas, is much bleaker. The inexorable danger is growing that you may become not a savior, but rather the cause of the demise of not only your country, but all of humanity. Mr. Putin, I am now appealing to your reason and conscience. Wake up. All these prophecies and predictions are an artfully woven web of narratives designed to program your consciousness. You are being coded, you are being manipulated, and unfortunately, you are succumbing to this influence. It pains me deeply to witness how you are gradually losing the ability to think independently and critically, becoming a victim of subconscious programming, including from those who have betrayed the teachings of Christ and become accomplices to Nazism. Mr. Putin, I could provide you with many more facts. However, the information I possess is not for public disclosure. I could share much with you in a personal face-to-face -face meeting. I could tell you things you are not aware of. However, the Nazi forces behind you are unlikely to allow such a meeting to take place. From my side, I am prepared to provide you with much more information. 
This concerns the future of your country, not vague predictions, but scientifically based forecasts by year. You need to know that your country is on the brink of a catastrophe, the scale of which you cannot even imagine. The geological situation is much more severe than you have been told. For example, tell me, do you have information about how close the magma is to the surface under the Siberian platform? Data indicates that at this moment, the magma's ascent to the surface beneath Siberia is accelerating. This accelerating rise of the mantle plume creates an increased risk of a mega explosion, which could happen at any moment. I understand that those who persuade you of your chosenness and role as a savior have also assured you that Siberia will become the cradle of civilization. It may become a cradle, but not in the way you have been told. It is a cradle that could lull the entire world into eternal sleep of death and you could be the person who leads all of humanity to its demise. Were you not told this? What a pity. I do not want to provoke panic among the population, so I cannot publicly disclose all the details, facts, and figures. Mass migration of people from Russia to other territories is currently highly undesirable and could exacerbate the situation. And migration is inevitable. Only a madman would remain in your country if they knew the true state of affairs. This information is too important and delicate to be discussed publicly. I am willing to share it with you in a personal meeting. I assure you that this information could fundamentally change your understanding of the current situation and the future of your country. I understand that you will not be coming to the United States in the near future. I am willing to meet you on neutral territory if, of course, the Nazis manipulating you allow it, which I highly doubt. Otherwise, returning to the topic of absurd statements and actions emanating from those close to you who claim the role of spiritual leaders. Let me remind you that the same religious figures who whisper sweet words about your chosenness and assure you that climate problems will resolve themselves propose fighting the increasing natural cataclysms with highly questionable methods. I refer to actions such as demonstrative flights with icons over flooded areas or public prayers for the easing of the elements. We observed in April this year how an attempt was made to repair a malfunction dam in one of your cities with a special prayer service by a priest. Naturally, this did not help. A day and a half after the prayer service, the dam burst and thousands of people and homes were flooded. Then by the order of the Metropolitan Bishop, special prayers for the end of the water invasion were offered during the Divine Liturgy and in all churches of the Orenburg Diocese. However, the situation continued to worsen. On April 11th, in the Kurgan region, priests took more radical measures with the support of State Duma deputies. They flew over the flooded areas with an icon of Mother of God. According to their plan, the purpose of the flight was to calm the elements and protect against further flooding. However, the prayers of the priest and the flights with the icon once again proved powerless. The powerful waters continued to rise and on April 13th, the water level peaked flooding new territories and farms. Let me remind you that the damage from this flood in Orenburg, according to preliminary estimates by your services, amounted to 40 billion rubles, equivalent to approximately 453 million US dollars. The history of your country knows the example of the 1941 flight over Moscow with the Kazan icon of the Mother of God, which allegedly saved your capital from Nazi capture. However, the current flight with an icon over the flood affected area did not improve the situation, did not save anyone and will not save anyone. Prayers against climate change do not work. Any religious representatives and shamans are powerless against what the world faces today. And I will go even further. If all the shamans, clergy and believers of your country were to gather in a united, 
deepest and most sincere prayer, they would not be able to keep even a leaf from falling from a tree when its time comes. Their prayer would lack the strength to prevent the natural fall of a simple leaf. However, even one little girl with a drop of glue could quickly resolve this issue. This is science. The time for science has come, not medieval superstitions. Science is the only path to survival, and we have only a few years left to find a scientific solution to the global climate problem. The real way to address the climate crisis is to establish an international moratorium on wars and the production and use of any type of weaponry for a minimum of 100 years. Create conditions where no country would even consider attacking another. Despite Russia being mired in fascism and reviving Nazism, and my country, the USA, on the brink of civil war, I still say we need to sit down at the negotiation table. Because if we do not, there will be no Russia, no America, no one. It is time to heed common sense and temper our ambitions. And then perhaps, Mr. Putin, the prophecy that you will become the savior of the world, or at least of Russia, might come true. In today's reality, I am unsure if you can save Russia, but to destroy it through the resurgence of Nazism happening before your eyes is very likely. Whether you will save the world is questionable but that you are already destroying it is a fact. To end all wars and political and economic disputes at the global level, we need the political will of a strong world leader. That requires your will, Mr. Putin, your participation and your rational acceptance of the situation. For this, you need to look at what is happening directly without distortions as a wise and independent person. However, is this even possible while you remain under the spell of those playing their own game behind your back? I want to believe that your sharp mind and intellect have not allowed you to completely dissolve under their lulling sweet words. I believe that deep down you remain an officer, that you can pull yourself together, grasp the severity and tragedy of what is happening, and bring the situation back under your conscious control. If you miss this chance now and allow Nazism to completely take over your entire country, there will be no turning back, and a grim end awaits us all. Mr. Putin, I am sure you know you are as mortal as the rest of us. You face health problems just like each of us. The difference is that you also bear the responsibility for a vast country and its millions of inhabitants. Remember your responsibility to the people. Remember your family and loved ones. Think of your father, of the fathers and grandfathers of your nation who shed their blood fighting fascism. What a disgrace that under your leadership, the inhumane ideology they eradicated at the cost of their lives is now rising again. Your church advisors preaching Nazi ideology are instilling in you illusions that people will remember you forever. Open your eyes, for heaven's sakes. What kind of eternal remembrance can there be if at the current rate of climate deterioration, Russia may not even exist five to six years from now? After that period, there will be no one left to remember you. And the words with which you will be remembered before that fatal moment are not hard to predict you will be cursed and hated. How else can people who endure horrific suffering, death and destruction because of you remember you? You will be cursed by everyone, from the hardworking ordinary Russian to the elite, your former friends, close ones and family. Everyone. I'll go even further. Even this year, masses of curses from people affected by the climate have been directed your very way not at the priest or those building Nazism behind your back, but at you. Because in Russia, power is associated with only one person, and that person is you, Mr. Putin. Therefore, in the eyes of the people, you are solely responsible for everything that happens in your country. We are well aware of the specifics of the Russian mentality. 
We have studied it for a long time, and you yourself know it well. A distinctive feature of your nation is that its people can love deeply and sincerely. Still with the same intensity, they can hate. When your people realize who is causing them such horrific suffering, they will ceaselessly curse you, Mr. Putin. Your language has an expression, I believe, raise on pitchforks. I think you understand what I mean. Therefore, ask yourself, have you indeed decided to reap the laurels of Stalin and Hitler combined, or do you wish to benefit your people and the world? If the current trajectory of events is not altered, given the escalating climate situation, you will soon lose both your wealth and power. You will lose everything. But what's worse, you will lose all respect. You will be a curse not only to Russia, but to the entire world. And even if you wish to be remembered as another Hitler, know that this scenario, there will be no one left to remember you. And to prevent the catastrophic scenario of future events, there is only one way, your participation in creating conditions to address the climate crisis on a global level. And to make this possible, it is first necessary to eradicate Nazism in your country and restore the democracy you profess to value so highly. You have been balancing on the edge of an abyss for a very long time. Those you considered allies can turn into your executioners at any moment. They will stop at nothing to maintain control and execute their plans. Are you confident in the people who stand behind you? Yes, your security seems reliable, but think about it. Can you be sure that among them there is no assassin recruited by the Nazis? Do you trust your inner circle? Reflect on this. Orders that contradict your own come from somebody among them. Someone initiated the destruction of democracy you aspire to. Someone has been systematically brainwashing you all this entire time. Someone has been destroying your country. I will say you even more. As a colleague to a colleague, yes, I know there have been attempts on your life, and your services have worked excellently in preventing these attempts partly thanks to our cooperation. But listen to me and ask yourself this particular question. Why did one of the people close to you recently acquire a contact poison, and from good allies no less? What do you think the purpose was, and more specifically, for whom? The truth is, those who control you have long been planning your replacement. The problem was only with your successor. But at this point, they have almost resolved this issue, with your help skillfully manipulating you. You unknowingly are bringing to power those they want to see in your place. You are a smart person, Mr. Putin. So think, you are up against true grand masters. Unfortunately, your current situation resembles a classic Zugzwag, where any move you make plays into their hands and only worsens your position. Consider, are you not at risk of repeating Stalin's fate? But these are your affairs, not ours, and it is up to you to deal with them. Stalin's reign lasted approximately 31 years, and on December 31, 2024, it will be exactly 25 years since the beginning of your rule, Mr. Putin. You have been in power for a quarter of a century. By the end of your current term, you could surpass even Stalin, and you will only have Empress Catherine the Great left to surpass, who ruled for just over 34 years. However, in light of the information I have disclosed, the question arises, will you have the chance to surpass even Stalin? By conveying this information to you directly and openly, Mr. Putin, I am breaking several protocols. This is my conscious decision. As a perceptive leader, you will undoubtedly understand its reasons. The public nature of my address is necessary to resolve a number of issues. Believe me, if the situation were not so critical, we would proceed as usual with traditional methods. However, now not only your life or the future of Russia is at stake, the entire world is under threat. Wise people, 
your true allies and even those manipulators behind your back will hopefully understand the real motives behind my actions. Humanity is facing an unprecedented crisis at a time when the world is under the looming threat of climate catastrophe, geopolitical tensions are at their peak, and we are witnessing the formation of, in essence, the Fourth Reich. Wisdom and common sense are more necessary than ever. Only they will allow humanity to survive this critical situation. And your role, Mr. Putin, in this process is immense. Therefore, replacing the leader of Russia at this moment would be a catastrophic mistake. It is not only untimely, but also extremely dangerous. And now I address you, those who stand behind the back of Putin, you wolves in sheep's clothing. We are well aware of your double game. What you say to Vladimir Vladimirovich, to his face, and what you do behind his back. We know your true intentions and plans. You are not the only ones working effectively. The fact that you managed to stay in the shadows for a long time is not your achievement. It was our temporary oversight. But now your time of impunity has come to an end. Now you should seriously consider your future. Mr. Putin, if we had the opportunity to meet one-on-one, -on -one, I could tell you much more. I assure you, you would be astonished by the truth of what is happening behind your back and the fate the Nazi ideologists have preparing for you. I know they will try to dissuade you from meeting with me, claiming that I am supposedly an American spy spreading disinformation. What else would they say? Nevertheless, I am telling you the plain truth right now, and you, Vladimir, understand this very well. You can distinguish truth from lies, but unfortunately, not always. When the lies come from those you trust, you perceive it as truth. However, do not blame yourself for this. The manipulation techniques you are regularly subjected to are so sophisticated that anyone can fall for them especially if they are unaware that such subconscious coding techniques exist. Even more so when it involves multi-level psychological manipulation, starting from basic psychology, playing on your weaknesses, dreams, desires, and even your fatigue, and extending to sophisticated methods of mind control, including the puzzle coding method. I am also well aware of, to put it mildly, the deep animosity of certain individuals' inner circle towards me personally. Moreover, I have reliable information from a trusted source that one of your close associates, someone you frequently dine with, has given the order to prepare an operation for my physical elimination. This order also includes the liquidation of several key representatives of the Alatra organization. I am profoundly concerned that the respected Igor Mikhailovich Danilov is on this hit list as well. With all seriousness, I emphasize that Igor Mikhailovich is a figure of genuine exceptional stature. He possesses deep knowledge that is key to ultimately overcoming the global climate challenge. Mr. Danilov's unique understanding of climatic processes and exceptional forecasting abilities are invaluable and irreplaceable for solving this problem. This is indisputable. We have witnessed that Mr. Danilov's climate forecasts 10 years ago have been confirmed with remarkable accuracy up to the present day. It is highly undesirable that his forecasts for the near future also come true. Mr. Danilov has also played a crucial role in our scientific research activities. His deep understanding of physical processes has enabled the creation of unique equipment to mitigate the effects of climate change. Our current knowledge and capabilities result from our collaboration with Mr. Danilov. His contributions are invaluable and the loss of such a person would be irreparable blow to all humanity. If we lose him, we will be left with nothing. Therefore, eliminating him would deprive humanity of its only chance. Mr. Danloff and I have already provided convincing evidence that we possess the knowledge and ability to deliver the necessary solutions to prevent climate catastrophes. 
For 10 years now, our experimental equipment protected your country, as well as parts of China, Kazakhstan, and Eastern Europe. Now that its operation has ceased, look at what is happening with the frequency and intensity of climate disasters in these same regions. The situation has worsened significantly everywhere. It was much more stable during the 10 years our equipment was operational. This gives me the right to assert that we, unlike others, have a much deeper understanding of the Earth's climatic and geodynamic systems. And with us, humanity's chance to withstand climate change can be quite real. I also want to address the person who gave this order and those who were planning to carry it out. Are you prepared to destroy the only people capable of preventing climate catastrophe? Suppose you succeeded. History shows that any person can be killed. Even Jesus Christ was crucified in his time. But what then? After crucifying us now, what will you do about the climate? How do you plan to stop the impending climate catastrophe? Let me put it metaphorically. Try to extinguish burning oil on a hot pan with water is very dangerous. It will explode. I hope you understand my point. And you, Mr. Putin, take note of what the Nazis behind your back are doing. They want to kill the only people who can solve the climate issue. The history of our activities speaks for itself. Our work has already saved you colossal amounts of money and provided Russia with the best climate conditions in the world for 10 years while our experimental installation was operational. And these resources would be quite sufficient for us to solve the climate problem worldwide if we were provided with the appropriate conditions. Allow me to ask you, Mr. Putin, if you allow their plan to be carried out, who will address the climate problems after our elimination? Do you have specialists capable of handling this task? I will answer for you. You don't. You don't have such people. Yes, you have a few brilliant scientists who could assist us, but you do not have the single person who possesses all the necessary knowledge to fully solve the problem of the rapidly escalating climate catastrophes and the impending global collapse. And please note, that while someone behind your back is issuing an order for my elimination and that of several people from Alatra, including Mr. Danilov, I am concerned about you. Yes, this is unconventional. I could have taken a different path, but you understand why I chose this approach and why I speak this way. I am fully aware that every word I say provokes fierce rejection from those who are currently manipulating you, Mr. Putin. But I cannot and will not remain silent. You must know the truth. Your so-called close associates are playing a dangerous game, putting the fate of billions of people at stake. Believe me, if the problem only concerned you or your country, I would not intervene. But today I address you to protect all people, including your children. My duty is to warn all of humanity about the impending threat. Mr. Putin, I know that your adversaries will attempt to conceal or distort the information I have presented today, or even prevent my message from reaching you. However, I am deeply convinced that true officers still remain in Russia. During my time working in Russia, I had the distinct honor and pleasure to routinely meet such individuals. Therefore, I know that for true Russian officers, Russia is not merely a territory for realizing their potential, but a homeland they have sworn to defend. It is on them that I place my hopes, on the true patriots of Russia who care about the future of their country, those who uphold the pride of their fathers and grandfathers who defeated Nazism, and being true officers will never bow before it. And now I want to address you specifically, officers who have remained faithful to your oath, who have preserved your honor and dignity in these difficult times for Russia. There was a time when Russia was on the brink. Your wise predecessors came to Boris Yeltsin. They opened his eyes to what was happening in Russia under his leadership. 
They told him then what to do and who to appoint as his successor. That successor was Vladimir Putin. At that time, it was absolutely the right decision, which subsequently allowed for the preservation of your country's integrity. And now, dear officers, it is your turn to open President Putin's eyes to the truth about what is really happening in your country behind his back. Do everything possible to ensure that President Putin hears my appeal to him directly. Convey to him the information presented in the film, The Impact. Only then can you save Russia and the world. And only together can we defeat both Nazism and the climate threat. And to you, Mr. Putin, I strongly recommend familiarizing yourself with the information in the film, The Impact. Since these materials have gained public attention, which will inevitably lead to severe consequences, it is critically important that you are personally informed about these facts. This is not only for understanding the full depth of the situation we all find ourselves in, but also to ensure you have the opportunity to take the necessary measures. In a world where power is valued above humanity and where power belongs to madmen, we are all standing on the edge of an abyss. I appeal to your reason, your humanity. I believe you have not entirely lost touch with reality and understand the immense responsibility that comes with your position. Remember, time is working against us. Every minute of delay plays into the hands of those who seek chaos and destruction. So disrupt their plans while you still have real power and capabilities. Do not miss this critical moment. You have long been told that you are the chosen one, the savior. So become one.